Hello, everyone. Uh, I am David Weinstein, director of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, also known as CJEB at Columbia Business School. On behalf of everyone at the center, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled The Japanese Economy, Second Edition, Book Launch. Today, we are joined with the authors of The Japanese Economy, uh, Takeo Hoshi and CJEB's own Takatoshi Ito. Uh, these two authors are giants in the field and have contributed enormously to my understanding of the Japanese economy, as well as that of generations of students. I first came across the first edition of Taka's book when I was just starting out as an assistant professor at Harvard. At that time, Japan's tremendous record of economic growth made it the envy of the world. And this book was by far the best introduction to the inner workings of the economy. Similarly, at approximately the same time, Takeo was writing some of the most influential papers on Japanese finance and finance in general in the last three decades. For a young assistant professor like me, these two researchers were my heroes. Uh, so I am delighted that they have decided to join forces and produce a new edition of their um, seminal textbook. The 30 years since the book was first published have not been kind to Japan. The Japanese economy went from being a model of economic development to a cautionary tale. When I first started teaching my course on the Japanese economy, the main question we focused on was, why was Japan doing so well? By the time I arrived at Columbia, the question of why was Japan do, uh, the question was, why was Japan doing so poorly? The answers to both of these questions are fascinating. Delays and mismanagement of Japan's banking crisis, which was just in its infancy when the first edition went to press, coupled with problematic fiscal, monetary, and deregulatory policy, helped produce a decade or two of slow growth. Real per capita growth in Japan averaged only 0.9% per year between 1992 and 2017, well below the 1.6% number for the US. The time was clearly ripe for a reassessment. And one of the questions I'm gonna start out by asking uh, our, our two authors though is, what took you so, so long? Why did it take 28 years to get to this point? It's something that, that uh, we've been waiting for for a long time, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, anxious to hear your new assessment. Ironically, Japan's woes have made the country even more relevant for, de for developed countries. A major reason for this relevance is um, uh, or excuse me, a, a major reason why the U.S. has been able to react ra rapidly to financial crises like the 2008 financial crisis was because we had studied Japan and learned the costs of delaying restructuring um, of, of banking sectors after a bubble. Similarly, Japan's fall into deflation or low inflation coupled with interest rates that are close to zero presaged similar predicaments in Europe and the United States. On the flip side, Japan's economy delivers many things better than the West. Japan's cities are clean, relatively crime-free, and their transportation systems are the envy of the world. Japanese live about five years longer on average than Americans and have per capita healthcare costs that are only 40% those of the United States despite having an older population. These differences have been particularly stark in the current pandemic in which Japan's per capita death rate from COVID-19 is only 1 40th that of the United States or the United Kingdom. The message is ignore Japan at your own peril. Taka and Takeo's new book couldn't have come at a better time. And I'm happy to say that it also came just in time 
for me to use it in my undergraduate class. And I think it's been wonderful for the students at Columbia, and I'm sure students in many classrooms around the world. While I could spend the entire webinar detailing their many accomplishments, I'm only going to give very brief introductions in the interest of time. Takatoshi Ito is a distinguished economist and scholar with wide ranging academic and policy experience. He is the director of CJEB's program on public pension and sovereign funds, as well as our associate director of research and professor at the School of International and Public Affairs. He has taught extensively both in the United States and in Japan at the University of Minnesota, Hitotsubashi, and at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. He has been teaching on the Japanese economy and on Asian financial markets since he came to Colombia. He was president of the Japanese Economic Association in 2004 and has been a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research since 1985. Taka also has broad experience in government. He was appointed to the International Monetary Fund as the senior advisor in the research department from 1994 to 1997 and served as Japan's Ministry of Finance deputy, served in Japan's Ministry of Finance as uh, Deputy Vice Minister for International Affairs uh, from 1999 to 2001. He's also been awarded the Japanese government's National Medal with Purple Ribbon in June of 2011 for his outstanding academic achievements. We are truly lucky to have him as a member of the CJEB family, and I am particularly lucky to have him as a friend. Takeo Hoshi is Professor of Economics at the University of Tokyo. Uh, he is also co-chairman of the academic board of the Center for Industrial Development and Environmental Governance at, at Tsinghua University. He was the Henry and Tomoya Takahashi Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute at, uh, for International Studies at Stanford University and Pacific Economic Cooperation Professor in International Economic Relations at the University of California, San Diego. He received the 2015 ja Japanese Bankers Academic Research Promotion Foundation Award, the 2011 Reischauer International Education Award of Japan, of the of Japan Society in San Diego and Tijuana, the 2006 Enjoji Jiro uh, Memorial Prize of Nihon Keizai Shimbun, and the 2005 Japan Economic Association Nakahara Prize. He has numerous publications on topics including corporate finance, banking, monetary policy, and the Japanese economy. Professor Hoshi received his BA from the University of Tokyo in 1983, his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, probably the premier program in economics in the United States in 1988. He is also a close friend of the center as, as one of our research associates and has been a speaker at more CJEB events than I can possibly uh, remember. Um, most recently in uh, 2018. So again, although it's only virtual, I want to welcome uh, Takeo back to, uh, to Colombia, or at least virtual Colombia. Uh, it's great to see you again. Uh, you can read more about our speakers and some of their achievements in their bios on this events page. Uh, after their presentation, we'll have time for questions and answers. Uh, please uh, send you in your questions through the Q&A feature in Zoom if you have not submitted your questions in advance. Uh, and finally, before we start, I just wanna take a moment to thank our corporate and individual sponsors for their generous donations. These gifts allow us to continue to develop and uh, deliver exceptional webinars like this one. Uh, you, without you, we couldn't uh, do any of this. Um, so now, without any further ado, I want to turn the floor over to Taka and uh, Takeo. Um, but I want, uh, hopefully, uh, 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 Taka to start by telling us, uh, what have you been doing over the last 28 years? Why did it take so long to get, this, uh, to get, to get us this new edition of your book? Uh, so the floor is yours, uh, and look forward to your comments. 
Thank you, David. Um, uh, thank you for a very warm uh, uh, welcome and the introduction. Uh, thank you very much. And but uh, it's uh, kind of embarrassing to admit that it took 28 years uh, to revise. So this is the first edition. So this was published in uh, 1992. And um, this is the um, second edition that just came out this year okay so what what what's between these two books uh 28 years right but let me start from uh um the why why i wrote the first edition to begin with and um uh i was uh teaching at the university of minnesota and nothing to do with the japanese economy when i got first job and, um, uh, but that was uh, 1980s. And as uh, David mentioned that um, interest in Japanese economy uh, was rising very quickly. Uh, so uh, there was a demand for the good, good papers and, and books uh, and teaching for the Japanese economy. So um, I was sort of drawn into the, uh, the field that um, uh, is called Japanese economy, which I, you know, I, I thought I knew Japanese economy well because I grew up in Japan and uh, uh, went to Japanese college, but it was not. I, I think the interesting part is to explain using economics models and logic to um, what, what's happening in the Japanese economy. And I, I took, I spent uh, many hours and many years actually to uh, come up with the, uh, some sort of logical thinking uh, to, uh, you know, any economists can understand what's going on in, in Japan. So it's not the, oh, Japan is so unique and you cannot, you know, replicate it, but uh, Japan works in uh, in uh, economics uh, logic and theory, but you know some conditions and 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 assumptions um, are different, so it produces um, uh, different kind of results. So that that was the uh, my first edition, and actually I was when I was writing drafts and drafts that uh, my you know I was looking up to uh, the uh, Hugh Patrick um, and Henry Rosofsky uh, book from uh, Brookings Institution, uh, which is called Asia's, Asia's New Giant. I think it came out in 1976, 75 or 76. And I was looking at the chapters of that book and I you know, tried to uh, do better. I wanted to uh, uh, go one step beyond that um, uh, then, back then, the standard textbook on Japanese uh, economy. So that was, you know, the story about the uh, first edition. And thank you, Hugh, for uh, guiding me to the, um, uh, uh, to the field. Then first book came, first edition came out in 1982. That was the beginning of the uh, collapse of the Japanese bubble, right? Oh, oh, in 92, it was already um, uh, beginning was, uh, was uh, seen. But after that, you know, the bubble collapse continued and continued, continued, no recovery, then went to banking crisis. Maybe I should have written the second edition around the, um, around the banking crisis, but it was so depressing. And um, I, I put off, the uh, second edition project um, uh, several times. And um, uh, then, you know, finally, uh, I think the, um, uh, actually the uh, Abenomics uh, uh, made me a little bit more cheerful and um, successfully recruited um, the co-author, Takeo, and um, uh, that was good. That uh, you know motivated uh, me and, and Takeo to uh, uh, to finish the second edition uh, project. 
So that is the, that is the story. It was too depressing uh, uh, to uh, revise uh, during the 28 uh, years. So let me um, share the screen to show the uh, table of contents, but Takeo may uh, want to add some, a few words. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, David, for a very kind introduction. And uh, I started out as a user of this textbook, as David did. Um, Taka, was ki Taka kindly shared the manuscript for this textbook with me. So I started teaching Japanese economy in 1990, I believe, at uh, UCSD. So when Taka uh, invited me to work on the second edition, I think it was more than 10 years ago now. Uh, I, I don't remember how, how long it took us to uh, uh, revise this uh, textbook, uh, much less than 28 years for me, but uh, it was um, my honor to uh, work with him. And I'm glad we finally finished revising this textbook and uh, we have the second edition because uh, if we waited longer, we would have observed some big changes like uh, COVID-19 happening to the Japanese economy and that would have delayed uh, our progress again. So, so I'm glad we finished uh, this textbook before all those uh, big events started to happen. So back to you, Taka. So this is the uh, table of contents. And um, um, I think the, uh, um, the uh, chapter one, two, didn't change much between the uh, uh, two editions, but economic growth uh, and the business cycles, they have, they, they went through extensive revisions for good reason. And um, uh, monetary system and monetary policy, public finance, all those macro chapters, then uh, demography became very important. So that became uh, uh, savings and demography and social security became one chapter. And um, uh, industrial structure, labor market, those are the uh, more micro uh, uh, type of uh, uh, chapters and international trade and finance. And um, uh, we have one sort of political economy chapter, US-Japan economic uh, 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 relations. And um, uh, that, that, is, um, that was a big, big topic in 19, back in 1982. Uh, the US pressure on Japan was very uh, uh, strong. Now it's kind of uh, diminished, but still it's um, a very important economic relations uh, between the two countries. Then the last chapter is uh, this, you know, 28 years what happened in 28 years between the first edition and the second edition. So this is cutting across all the um, uh, chapters, earlier chapters, and to try to explain uh, what happened uh, and why it took so long to recover from the deflation and uh, uh, stagnation. So that chapter 14 is the chapter between the first edition and second uh, uh, edition. Okay, so that's a brief introduction of the uh, second uh, uh, edition and why it took so long uh, between the first edition, second edition. David? So, um, that, th thanks. I mean, I, th I think I'd like to, um, um, uh, you know, both of you, I, 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 I'm, I'm incredibly privileged because actually I, I should also say, uh, Takeo, that I, um, I signed your book in my class as well, your your uh, corporate governance and, and finance book. So so I've got two textbook authors um, uh, here, and and I wanted just to start off by uh, talking about that that last chapter, um, your your chapter fourteen. Um, you know, and as, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, one of the big changes in Japan, you know, is you know maybe the first. You know, if you say, you know, from 1850 to, you know, roughly 1990, the story is Japan's catch up with the West, right? How did that happen? Um, you know, Japan growing, you know, on average faster than, than the West. And then when we look at um, the last two decades, right, 
the, you know, even on a per capita basis, uh, Japan has, you know, Japan has been growing slower than the United States. And so it's actually a story of divergence um, with, with uh, the West. And uh, as you, as uh, Taka uh, mentioned, you know, the, the um, you know, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe impl implemented a series of policies to try to turn things around um, and raise, um, uh, raise uh, growth rates. Um, and, you know, we're still kind of, you know, Japan is still, you know, maybe, you know it, did, it did end deflation, but it, you know, we've had the COVID period and it's kind of pretty close to zero again. And I guess the question is kind of what's your, what's your final assessment? You know, when, when, when the history is written about, you know, Prime Minister Abe's policies, um, you know, not in terms of what he tried to do, but what he actually accomplished, how do you think that's, um, how do you think that's going to be, how, how do you assess that? Okay, let me, um, let me uh, take a first shot. Uh, my assessment uh, is that um, uh, Abenomics uh, succeeded in uh, uh, lifting the economy out of deflation. So inflation rate became positive. Uh, it was uh, below 2% target, but at least it is in the positive range. And um, uh, the fiscal policy has been uh, flexible as uh, Abe, Prime Minister Abe wanted to do. So it was um, stimulative when it was needed, but it was also um, uh, consolidating, uh, tightening uh, when economy uh, it was good. So in the sense, macro uh, management, demand side management by monetary policy and fiscal policy, I would say succeeded. Um, what was um, uh, missing or um, underachieved was uh, the, what, what is called third arrow, the growth policies. And um, uh, that was um, uh, okay. I mean, uh, it was good, but not um, uh, tremendously excellent performance. And one of the reason was that the um, demography, uh, the weight of the uh, sort of a pull of the demographic uh, change was so strong that uh, you couldn't um, uh, you couldn't compensate enough to have um, high economic growth. So roughly speaking, uh, you know, population working age population was declining by one percent, so minus one percent. So even if the per capita it was growing at two percent, the actual result was only one percent uh, increase, which is you know less than U.S. So goes to a divergence story. So first arrow, second arrow success, and third arrow, arrow was okay, but not great. Takeo, you wanna add something? Yes, uh, I, I think I mostly agree with uh, what Taka said. The first two arrows, monetary expansion and the fiscal policy were overall successful. It, again, it didn't achieve the 2% inflation uh, two percent inflation goal or a two percent real growth goal e either, but the demand side is certainly much better than when Ab Abenomics started. Uh, I would like to qualify what Taka said uh, on two things. The one is that the fiscal policy, fiscal consolidation. I, I think what the uh, Japanese government needed and now need is a fiscal consolidation in the long run, so to speak. There's a guarantee that uh, uh, fiscal condition will be in healthy situation in the long run. So in a sense, uh, what the Japanese government need is like a forward guidance in fiscal policy, which I think that Abenomics uh, didn't do a good job as they uh, stated to do at the beginning of Ab Abenomics. And for the structural reform, um, I, I think I'm, I'm with Taka. There have been some success, but uh, I would say uh, more than half failure or didn't do not, not enough efforts to change the Japanese economic structure. And Taka mentioned the impact of the demographic decline, the, the population decline and that influence on 
the economy grows. And I think that argument is often exaggerated. Um, at the same time, the population declined uh, in Japan, the participation rate increased. So now, so the, the decline of the employment is not as much as a minus 1%, but a little bit lower. And uh, so, and, and, and that, that is uh, certainly, uh, uh, that, that, that is not uh, good for the economic growth, but still um, the, lack, the lack of growth of the Japanese economy comes more from the lack of productivity growth than the decline of the population. So I, so it's, I, I'm not blaming Taka, but uh, some, some people use the uh, demographic uh, changes as an excuse for the lack of uh, economic growth in Japan. And I don't think that, uh, that that's the right approach. Uh, so so that, that, that's very interesting. I wanna kind of just, just follow a little on that. I mean, one of the things that's also different about Japan is that the labor force itself has been shrinking um, fairly rapidly relative, even relative to the population. So if you look at, you know, growth per worker, it looks better than uh, growth per capita. And one of the, one of the, um, uh, and, and then in the book, you, 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 you know, one, I guess one bright spot in this, in this area has been, you know, what has been happening with uh, female labor force participation. And, you know, one of the chapters, I, I think it's um, your uh, chapter 10 uh, in your book, uh, you discuss uh, womenomics, which was um, the part of Abenomics that was trying to kind of push against this, this decline in the population uh, growth rate. And um, you argue uh, that womenomic, the womenomics policy was successful, at least in increasing the labor force participation of women. Um, but this year, the employment of women has been declining faster than the employment of men uh, following the pandemic. So I guess one question that I just would like to kind of toss out is, you know, are, you know, how, you know, on the one hand, I think, I think Abe get, deserves a lot of credit for, you know, making this an important issue for Japan and trying to get um, you know, raise female labor force participation. On the other hand, I guess there's some concerns about whether we're going to see this rolling back. And I wondered what, what your thoughts were on that. So, uh, as, um, as Taka prepared slide, yeah. uh, I guess. Keep, keep uh, I, talking, I'd, like, Taka. I'd like to mention one thing, the, well, one thing about what David said. The, it, it is, so, so it is a working population that Japan is experiencing the decline. The working population is declining. And the working population is defined to be the population between age 15 and 64 or something like that, which is uh, slightly different from uh, labor force uh, because uh, many people, many Japanese after 65 years old uh, continue to work. And also as you, as David mentioned, women who, were, who didn't participate in the labor force uh, started to, uh, to, to work, to join the labor force. So labor force decline, I, I think the labor force uh, has actually been increasing in Japan, even though working population defined in a standard way has been declining. And uh, the increasing labor participation of women is shown in this uh, graph that uh, Taka will explain. Okay, so... Um... This is uh, Japan, uh, female participation rate. And uh, it, back in 1975, there was a big dip in uh, age brackets, uh, 25 to 35. Uh, and this is um, a child uh, bearing and caring years. And from uh, 75 to 85, 95, 2005, this dip uh, became uh, shallow, which means that they decided to keep working while they are uh, raising uh, 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 small children. Then uh, by 2019, that, you know, it was, almost M-shape disappeared, almost disappeared. 
and uh, comparable, I would say, to U.S. So this is the uh, what um, uh, we call that uh, womenomics uh, uh, succeeded. Actually, it started before, even before the abenomics, but uh, 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 it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a success to bring in the women to continue working, and some of them continue the career. Uh, that is a big uh, success story. And this is, um, uh, let's see. Um, but, well, what David said is exactly right. And the, uh, after the COVID-19 shock, uh, women have been losing more jobs than men. And this uh, trend seems to be changing. And uh, mm. uh, yeah, so, so this is, uh, Th th this shows uh, employment of uh, male and female on a different scale. The men is measured on the left scale and the female is measured on the right scale. So this shows a gain of uh, employment by women from 2015 to 2019. Uh, that's what Taka showed in MCurve. Um, and uh, employment increased more than men. And, and now um, the women seems to have lost the jobs more rapidly than men uh, after the COVID-19 shock, although there have been some gain in the last two months or so. So uh, there, there is a concern that uh, if this trend, uh, the trend, the, the changes in September, October um, starts to uh, change again, and uh, there's a downward trend of uh, female employment continues. Um, then uh, there's a chance or there's a danger that uh, Japan loses the gain that, uh, that they gained in economics period. So I think that's a real concern, although it doesn't seem to be happening yet, but uh, we, we can't be sure. Let, let, let me just, um, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have more to talk about on this? I... Uh, no, this, this, is, this is a different picture. So David, please. Yeah. Um, so, so since you, since you just raised uh, COVID, I, I, I want to just talk a little bit about this. So, so right after Taka wrote the, the first book, um, uh, Japan's banking sector melted down and uh, the, 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 the economy suffered a, uh, a, a terrible downturn. And uh, just after he wrote, uh, just after the two of you uh, put together this book, um, uh, we've had the worst pandemic, uh, uh, Japan suffered the worst pandemic since, I guess, 1918. Um, and I guess one of the things that was, that, that to me has been really interesting is uh, just different, you know, sitting in, a, you know, I obviously haven't been in Japan in, in, in actually now it's, it's uh, over a year. Um, um, but my sense was that the Japanese government um, handled the pandemic very differently than the United States government. Um, you know, I had Japanese friends complaining that uh, uh, when they sent out the masks to everyone, it was too slow and the masks weren't high enough quality. And it was kind of a very different debate than, than, than uh, should you wear a mask at all. Um, and I guess, I guess just turning this now back to, to the economy, I guess one question I wanted to just raise with you is how do you how do you evaluate um, the Japanese government's response to COVID? My sense is that you know so certainly as I mentioned in my my, my opening remarks, you know just in terms of death rates, it's off the charts better than than what we're seeing in, in the United States and much of Europe. Um, and the Japanese government has uh, done a fairly substantial fiscal policy, right, uh, as, as, a as a result of this. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, um, you know, dare I say, when you, when you write uh, uh, the third edition, uh, the <laughs> uh, how, do you see the, how do you see this uh, affecting Japan? So let, let, let me start. Um, uh, I think that uh, we don't know uh, what's happening uh, completely yet. Right, and it is right that I, I can show you. Uh, I can show some graphs, but the um, the number of uh, uh, infected cases uh, is much lower in Japan uh, compared to the U.S. or Europe, and we don't know why the infection rate is so low. And uh, some people say it's a washing hands and wearing 
masks. Uh, some people say there must be some cross uh, immunity from uh, uh, other types of uh, other strains of coronaviruses. And some people say, uh, you know, those, those uh, government policy of um, um, asking people to stay home um, has been working. And um, uh, we, we, we haven't seen that definitive study on why the Japanese, or actually it's a East Asia, uh, East Asia infection rate uh, has been so low compared to the uh, US or particularly to, to, uh, to Europe. So that's why the, I think the government uh, restrictions on economic activities in Japan uh, has been uh, more relaxed than, uh, than the US. So in, in Tokyo right now, we can go to restaurants and uh, uh, wine and dine uh, until 10 p.m. Um, but in, the, in New York, uh, inside uh, indoor dining is limited to 25% of the capacity and many people are dining outside the uh, restaurant terrace uh, uh, table and, 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 and so on. So um, I think the government softer approach is actually the results of um, infection rate is so low compared to the US and Europe. And um, uh, we still don't know exactly what are the factors uh, that will, that contributed, uh, con contributing to the Japanese and East Asia success of uh, containing the COVID um, uh, uh, infections. Takeo, you have more I, I, uh, thoughts? I, I'm with you, Taka. Uh, so I, I think despite the loose or less stringent policy uh, in, in Japan, uh, Japanese situation has been much better than the Europe or the US. And uh, as you know, I moved to Japan, moved, moved from Stanford to University of Tokyo last fall. So I'm glad I did that move before the COVID-19 started <laughs> and I can spend time in Tokyo now instead of uh, uh, Northern California. Uh, but uh, there, there, it's, a, it's a puzzle why, uh, well, it, it's, uh, as, as Taka said, the policy is more of a result than the cause for the good health outcome of the Japanese COVID-19 situation. Although if you compare the death rates of Japan to uh, other Asian countries, Japan is not so low, a little bit higher than uh, some uh, many, many other Asian countries like Korea or China. So that's, a, that's divided by infected, right? That's divided the population. Oh, population? Okay. Yeah, like 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that, um, that uh, you know, Japan has had very good public hygiene education for, for a long time. And, you know, my sense is that it, the government didn't need to tell people to wear masks. They put the masks on pretty fast. And, you know, my sense is that that's, all, that's probably true. I mean, I, I don't know, uh, but, but if I went to rural Japan, uh, I would see the same type of behavior, whereas, um, you know, I think I think in the United States you've got, you know, New York where I'm where I'm living looks pretty good. Most people seem to be wearing masks, um, but um, my sense is that in the Midwest, uh, at least until recently, there were a lot of people not wearing masks, and so you had that that mixing. I don't know if that's a factor uh, uh, for Japan. Let me let me turn the discussion a little bit um, to um, another uh, 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 change that's coming now, so now that the book is out, and I realize this may seem a little unfair to you. Um, so we have a new prime minister in Japan, Prime Minister Suga, um, who is um, uh, starting, I guess, uh, I guess this is now going to be a trend. Everyone's going to have Abenomics, Suganomics, et cetera. Um, and has been emphasizing uh, digitalization of Japan, um, you know, trying to make Japan uh, uh, zero net in terms of greenhouse gases, um, and uh, doing that by 2050. 
Um, the textbook, of course, you know, doesn't discuss these 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 uh, two issues, but um, I wanted to get a sense of what you thought about about Suga's policies. Um, whether it makes sense is the first question, and then you know, what does Japan actually need to do in order to make them a reality? Okay, let me start. Um, well, Mr. Suga uh, became prime minister, but uh, he faces two deadlines. One is the uh, uh, the uh, House of Representative term uh, expires uh, next uh, October. So he has to call an election before October at some opportune time that he can choose. And he also faces the party leader, LDP party leader election uh, in September next year. So he has one year to prove that uh, he's competent and uh, he's a, he, he'll be a success. Uh, to be re-elected. So um, I think he's uh, 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 somewhat rushing uh, to get uh, results. So it's more of the low hanging fruits that he has to pick, harvest uh, before those uh, two elections. So that is a political constraint. And um, that explains a little bit uh, what, what um, uh, what um, uh, he's going after. So let me um, try to share the screen while uh, Takeo uh, continues to follow. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I agree with you. The, 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 at least for a digital policy, this is something the Japanese government has been trying to do, uh, although not as rapid as Suga want to do now. So it may be able to, we may be able to call that in low hanging fruit. Uh, and I hope they will be successful. But the climate change, the, the climate policy is not, or greenhouse gas policy is not the low hanging fruit. Uh, it's a, in a sense, it's easy for a different reason. Since the goal of that policy is set at 2050, uh, which is a long, long time. Uh, so the, the, when, when Suga is in the, in the government, uh, he will not be able to, uh, he will not be held responsible for any uh, result for the, or the result for the policy will not be clear when uh, during his uh, tenure. So this is a greenhouse gas emission figure. So for the last five years or so, uh, the Japan has been reducing the greenhouse gas emission. So if we just extrapolate this trend uh, I, I think you get very close to zero by 2020. So that may be, uh, 2050, I'm sorry, 2050. So that may be what uh, Japanese government or the government official may, may have done. It's not clear to me what they will do to achieve uh, zero emission by 2050 because the, the, they, the, the details of their policy is not clear yet. What, what so do you think, I think Taka? Suga has been, Prime Minister Suga has been uh, emphasizing uh, innovation and innovations in uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, innovations in uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, uh, technology, and uh, uh, possibly carbon capture and ca carbon recycling. But those are the ideas, I think. Uh, at this point, so and he those, those are those are not new either. The, that, they they were new. included in abenomic structural reform. Right. So um, I think the challenge is that uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga has to make it uh, um, make it possible that those technological innovations happen, and how is a question we, we have. I think the, are we gonna need uh, carbon pricing that many economists uh, prefer to, to be an incentive for those uh, innovations uh, or else? So um, that, that's the question we have and we are waiting for the uh, government to come up with, the, with um, a concrete plan to make those innovations happen. Let, let, yeah, the, let the only, 
sorry, go ahead. So, sorry, the, the only incentive they have been talking about uh, the subsidies for innovation, the R R R and D. Sorry, David. Let, let, let me let me just push you on one thing. I mean, so so a lot of um, people in the energy field feel that um, the simplest way to reduce carbon emissions is to is to increase nuclear. Um, and you know, even and you know, just just on the, uh, I, I realize Japan has had this uh, uh, disastrous experience with with uh, the Fukushima reactor, but um, you know, on the other side, people say, well, you know, this is one of the worst things we've, one of the worst uh, experiences we've had. And at the end of the day, you know, nobody died. Um, and so, you know, relative to the damage that carbon emissions do you know, does and is likely to do in the future, nuclear looks like something that is very clean and, and very safe, right? Um, you don't have the whole global warming problem with it. it. Is there a chance that Japan will go back to nuclear or is that just not something that we should think about in the, in the foreseeable future? Well, let me start uh, um, that uh, the government clearly aims at restarting the nuclear power plants. And um, uh, Japan has introduced a, a much stricter safety standard for reopening the uh, existing uh, power plants. So uh, slowly that uh, nuclear uh, is uh, coming back, but nowhere uh, to the level that um, uh, it had before the uh, Fukushima accident. So um, uh, that, that is a challenge. And also that's part of the plan of this um, uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, but challenge, extra challenge is that even if you succeed, government succeeds in reopening those uh, nuclear power plants, that the, there is, a, there is a, a limit that they can operate. Um, you know, currently 60 years is the uh, limit they can, uh, they can extend from 40 years to 60 years operation of a nuclear power plant. Can Japan uh, uh, build a new uh, nuclear power plant to replace the retiring nuclear power plants? And I'm much less confident that um, uh, it can be done uh, given what happened in Fukushima. And there, there, there are certainly challenges, but uh, I, I think the government intention, I, I think they are they're explicit on, on this. The intention is to increase the dependence on the nuclear uh, electricity, uh, at least compared with the current situation. It may not go back to a 30% of the total energy, total electricity. But uh, so, so I think the, uh, well, uh, the nu nuclear, nu nuclear strategy is a part of the strategy to reduce the emission. Um, so, so I want to change change the discussion a little bit, shift shift gears a little bit. There's been some questions on the on the Q and A about um, uh, the international dimension, globalization in Japan. Um, and um, I want to talk about this in in, in two dimensions. First, um, in your chapter chapter eleven of your book, um, uh, which deals with uh, international trade. Um, you know, one of the things that you uh, uh, discuss a lot is, you know, that 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 um, uh, you know, although manufacturing has been declining in Japan, uh, there's increased trade in services, and in particular, tourism has been uh, rising a lot in Japan. Uh, you know, the, Big improvements in, in airports. Uh, thank you, Taka. I know Taka was very much involved in uh, in, uh, in, in in opening or reopening uh, uh, Haneda for um, uh, Americans uh, traveling from from uh, uh, from the West, and I've appreciated that. Um, but uh, obviously, COVID has been a real negative for tourism in Japan and and around the world, um, and. I guess the question is, you know, that that's had some negative consequences for Japan. Uh, what is that going to mean for the future? Do you see Japan, Japanese tourism 
uh, 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 coming back uh, in retrospect? Did Japan become too dependent on tourists? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Taco, do you want to take that question? Uh, sure. Um, so I, I think there have been some disagreement with, between Taka and me on this. I wasn't very op optimistic about uh, the dependence on tourism for, for the Japanese economy to start with, even before the COVID-19. Uh, I was expecting some uh, decline of the tourism after the Olympics. And that was a worry, that was a risk I was thinking of. And now that risk uh, realized uh, even before from a different shock, the COVID-19. So I don't think we can continue, count, continue counting on the foreign tourists or inbound travel for, to improve the service, uh, so, so service exports or service uh, balance. But uh, another thing which is included in the service balance is uh, technology transfer, the, the Japanese, Japan's revenue from selling technology uh, to the rest of the world or getting loyalty from the rest of the world. And that part has been increasing too, even though it hasn't been as dramatic as the foreign tourists. And that part, I, I think, will continue to be an important part of the Japanese uh, service play. But Taka, uh, Taka, so, so your, your sense is that, you know, let's say in a year's time, most people who want it can get a vaccine, um, that that won't be enough to get people just to come back to Japan and, uh, you know. As much as visit. they did, did uh, two years ago? Maybe more because there's a lot of pent up Maybe demand. <laughs> okay, well, it, it's certainly possible, but, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not optimistic. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, well, there, there are two views, I think. Uh, this is, you know, the increase in, uh, increase in the uh, tourists, inbound tourists to Japan, and which disappeared completely in, uh, in the last uh, several months. So you, you can see this dr dramatic um, uh, change. Well, um, I, I think as soon as that we get uh, vaccines uh, available to many people, most of the population, and um, uh, the treatment uh, has uh, improved, um, then uh, tourists will be back. The question is how, 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 how much do, do we go back to the uh, this? Uh, um, 30 million uh, uh, inbound people or um, uh, somewhere uh, lower. And the you know, pessimistic view is that we get used to this uh, Zoom meeting and uh, webinars that we don't have to travel. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, both in academic world uh, and business world. So um, that is a big question, um, but I, I think you know it will. The number will increase. Number of tourists will increase, and and probably takes uh, two or three years. But I, I'm more optimistic than Takeo. In uh, uh, those uh, visitors will be back uh, in Japan. And, and, and let me let me just ask a little bit just on this international dimension. Um, um, you know, China has obviously uh, become, you know, a, a flashpoint in terms of U.S. policy. Obviously, um, it's you know very influential in in Asia as well. Of course, um, how do you see economic relations with China developing over the next uh, the next few years? Um, let me take um, uh, that question first. Um, it's it's an interesting question. I, th I think um, uh, during the four years of uh, Trump administration, the Trump administration has been very tough on China, and we, we know that, and went into uh, trade wars, raising the tariffs on the bo both countries. Um, during those uh, sort of tension uh, between two countries, China decided that this is opportune time to, to have the Asia or the beyond uh, to the, uh, to the um, uh, China's um, uh, uh, 
friends. And uh, so China became much more uh, softer toward Asian countries, especially Japan, right? So um, the, uh, uh, China thought this is a good time to uh, put a wedge between Korea and US, put a wedge between Japan and the US. And uh, uh, China want, needed uh, to have those uh, friends to uh, when, when the uh, relationship with the uh, US uh, soured. So, um, you know, first thing that um, uh, President Trump did was to withdraw from TPP. And TPP of this 12 countries in the Asia Pacific uh, had uh, this uh, TPP agreement, which is actually very clean, uh, high level uh, free trade agreements. And US went out and Japan tried to get those 11 countries, including Japan, to be a uh, uh, new uh, TPP. So it's called CPTPP and uh, successfully builds that, uh, build back uh, the TPP without US. But uh, now there is, a, there is a, 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 a chance for China to join TPP and get TPP within with uh, Chinese uh, uh, world. Also, you know, uh, RCEP, which is the uh, 16 country uh, uh, tr free trade agreement, India is out. So now it's 15 countries, uh, including Japan, Korea, China, and uh, 10 ASEAN countries, and New Zealand and uh, Australia. But China was much more forthcoming to conclude RCEP and also forthcoming to join TPP before US comes back. So the US China tensions have the spillover effect on the Asia that um, uh, maybe Asia, if, if you believe in Asia's uh, economic integrations and, and uh, political cooperation to be good, it is, a, it is a chance, but it is a loss for the US uh, uh, to, have the ch to, to have the bigger influence in uh, Asia Pacific. That's the sort of the um, very much of a loss during the uh, uh, Trump administration and how the Biden administration will quickly change and go back to the pre-Trump era or not uh, is, a, is a good question. Maybe, um, maybe um, David can answer that question. Um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a little early to know. Um, I want to, I want to, I, I, and I want to keep the, the focus on, on the two of you, so I'm not going to opine. I've, I've got a, a question from uh, Jacob Schlesinger from the uh, Wall Street Journal, and I just thought um, I would be useful to, to kind of shift gears again and talk about um, public finance in Japan. Um, and uh, I know um, uh, you and I have kind of come out on, on different, different sides on, on this, this question at, at, at different times. Um, in, in the textbook, you argue that um, Japan's uh, public debt is, is too large to be uh, sustainable. Um, but um, as many people and many US economists are now thinking one of the big lessons uh, from Japan is that um, big debt, you know, big, large, large levels of debt uh, don't matter that much uh, and that uh, governments can, you know, interest rates are low and um, worrying about restructuring the debt and fiscal consolidation um, it may do more harm than good and that this provides us with a, a rare opportunity to, to invest in various, uh, various projects you might think in Japan, maybe this is the time to invest in more childcare for, for women or, or other things that might, might help um, uh, improve the uh, uh, productivity. Um, and so I guess a question is, um, first, you know, given, you know, certainly if you'd asked me, you know, 
uh, 20 or 30 years ago, if the Japanese debt levels get to this level, what would the interest rates be? I wouldn't have answered that by saying there'd be zero or pretty close to zero. So why is it that interest rates have been persistently low? You know, and, 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 and also we see that long-term interest rates in Japan are pretty close to zero. So it doesn't seem like the market is forecasting a major you know, financial crisis in the next you know, five to 10 years. What's going on? What, what's, the, what's the magic of Japan in this dimension? Let me let me start and quickly <clears throat> give a uh, voice um, micro microphone to uh, Takeo. I th I think the um, <clears throat> the interest rate is low in Japan and also in the U.S. and um, Europe uh, because uh, there are much more um, uh, savings than investment and also central banks are uh, giving all those uh, uh, liquidity uh, to the economy. So um, that is um, uh, that. That is the reason that uh, central banks are buying more uh, bonds, uh, government bonds, and that is uh, that is contributing to uh, keep the long-term interest rate uh, low. And um, um, I, I think that's right. Uh, that's a r good policy uh, in uh, fighting the uh, COVID-19 uh, recession. And it was right uh, uh, in the global financial crisis back in 2008, 2009. My, my view is that in between those crises, uh, crises um, I, I'd prefer to see that uh, fiscal conditions to be a uh, uh, restored, the deficit to be lowered. That is my um, uh, my my uh, thinking. But um, so so when we go back to growth path, I think we we should we should reduce uh, deficits. Uh, otherwise, we we are um, we'll be shifting the burden to the future generation, uh, and that that is not good. So I can share some slides while Takeo can. Uh, uh, elaborate on that. Oh, okay, so we, we've been giving out this warning for at least the past 10 years, uh, but uh, the market doesn't seem to listen. And uh, um, I, I think the main major reason or the main reason why Japan has been able to keep the interest low, even though the government has been increasing the budget deficit and the debt, is that there is an expectation that in the market that eventually the Japanese government will be able to consolidate the budget situation. So uh, we don't know when, and that's possible. So, so in a sense, uh, I, I'm arguing the market interest rate is low because the market thinks the interest rate will be, we can, can be low. The, the market thinks the government, uh, uh, the government will change the behavior so that the debt situation becomes sustainable at some point in the future. And what, what I've been worrying about and, and uh, what I've been uh, talking about in the last 10, at least in the last 10 years, is that type of expectation can change for uh, may, maybe no good reason. And that's the danger uh, the Japanese bond market has now. And let me add uh, one more thing. Uh, I agree with David, uh, it's um, interest, rate, interest rate has been low, including the long-term interest rate. So uh, this is a good time or the government, if it wants to take advantage of the low interest rate by um, issuing the long-term government debt at this point with, with a very low interest rate. But what the Japanese government, if you consider the consolidated uh, government, which includes the central bank. Uh, what the Japan, Japan has been doing is to, it ha has been to replace the long-term government debt by short-term BOJ debt. Uh, th this is what the B BOJ buying of the long-term government debt means. And so that uh, uh, total, the maturity structure becomes shortened. So that seems to be the, uh, the other way, uh, the, 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 the exactly the opposite of uh, what the Japanese government should do if they want to take advantage of the low interest rate. And uh, is a slide 
ready now. Uh, let, let's make it bigger. And uh, so we can see that this, this is a graph that shows uh, JGB holdings, including the short-term bills uh, by holders, by the identity of the holders. And the Bank of Japan holding, which is a red pot in the bottom, has been increasing very rapidly. Taka, do you want to talk about this? Yes, so um, some people, uh, uh, to repeat what uh, Takeo said, some people think that um, <clears throat> central bank buying long bonds mean, means that um, uh, it disappears. You know, magically those uh, government debt uh, disappears because central banks hold them. But as Takeo mentioned that Bans Bank of Japan has liability side on its balance sheets. And it's not, uh, 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 it's not um, a pure asset uh, that um, a central bank is acquiring. The liability side is actually the uh, large, um, large um, uh, deposits from the uh, commercial banks, uh, e uh, excess reserves in the balance sheet. So that means that uh, if you consolidate the uh, uh, government and Bank of Japan, two balance sheets, then uh, government is now holding a short-term liability rather than long-term liability because that is what uh, central bank balance sheet has. What does it mean? It means that when the interest rate starts to rise, maybe two years from now, five years from now, uh, then um, it needs um, very uh, uh, large funding to those short-term uh, uh, debt because short-term debt interest will, rate will rise faster than long-term uh, interest rate, uh, which they, they have as an asset in Bank of Japan. So uh, they need the uh, cash flow payment to the short-term debts. And um, uh, so that, that means that uh, consolidated balance sheets uh, uh, has a vulnerability to the uh, increase in the interest rate. Well, if you believe that interest rate will be low, zero forever, the story is different. But you know, we do believe that interest rate will start rising sometime in the future maybe not in the very near future, but um, uh, in the medium, medium run that we will face the uh, normalization. Uh, 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 and that, that is the time that we will find the difficulty in the um, uh, public finance. And let, let me add one more that um, uh, uh, it, um, what, where, where to spend uh, those money to support the economy is important, right? So David mentioned, if we use those money for infrastructure and um, uh, uh, increasing those um, for the innovation, uh, which would contribute to the higher productivity gains in the future, that's fine. But look at what US is, spending money this year and Japan is spending uh, the money this year. They're giving those um, money as an income transfer to those who, who lost job uh, and um, uh, 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 found that their income has um, uh, declined due to those um, uh, economic activities uh, shut down, shutting down. Okay, so what Japan did was to distribute the 1,000 US dollar equivalent, uh, uh, 100,000 yen, to all the residents, every resident uh, in, in Japan. So Takeo got it. I didn't get it because I, I live in New York. But that is supported by long-term government bonds, 10-year bonds, right? So what does it mean? It means that you get uh, 100,000 yen, uh, roughly 1,000 US dollars, but that should be repaid in 10 years. 
if you consume and, you know, uh, uh, that's bad to say, but if, if, I, if someone dies in 10 years, then that is the net gain of his or her lifetime income. But if you leave, live beyond 10 years, then it's, you have to pay it back by increasing taxes. What if the uh, grandchild who's just born missing the deadline of, of 100,000 yen, then uh, he or she will bear the cost in 10 years without having the um, uh, eaten uh, uh, food and cake uh, uh, this year. So it's just a shifting pure income transfer from future generation to those who are living uh, this year. So you have, if the economy is expanding and if the population is expanding, that's fine. That would be, you know, debt uh, and burden will be diluted. But in Japan, population is declining. So this shifting the burden, increase, you know, the income transfer this year by, by issuing 10-year bonds is a pure income transfer from future generations, taking, you know, depriving the resources from future generations and give it to those who are living uh, this year. I don't think that's a good policy uh, uh, and uh, has, to be, uh, has to be repaid when economy uh, gets back to a uh, growth uh, path um, uh, as quickly as possible. So that is, you, you have to add this um, intergenerational, uh, as inter intergenerational uh, income transfer aspects and um, this de demographic uh, uh, transition uh, to smaller uh, uh, population uh, is, uh, is a very important part of the discussion uh, in this fiscal de deficit. Let, let me just, you know, let, let, let me just, um, I, I just want to kind of uh, also just get your views just on the tax increases that we've seen. So there've been, you know, um, uh, I, I happen to be listening to a podcast in which Adam Posen was arguing that, uh, you know, one of the problems in Japan was also fiscal policy um, being kind of too worried about uh, the debt levels and um, uh, thinking about, you know, uh, the, the tax increase in 97, you know, which then was immediately followed by a, a, a recession. And then we've had uh, a later tax increase that also did that, 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 that also resulted in a, uh, a recession. One, how do you see this now, now with, with 20, over the last 20 years? I mean, has the government, you know, if you could go back in time and, uh, and, and advise the government, would you have just said, you know, we should have done those tax increases? Should there be more tax increases? Um, how, do we, how, do we, uh, how do we think about that? Um, okay, let me start. Um, so I, you know, I usually uh, favor the consumption tax increase because I think that's a fair uh, way to collect taxes from uh, everybody. So we have a large population chunk who has, who has already retired. So they don't pay uh, personal income tax. So again, the generational uh, aspects is very important that if you increase the uh, personal income tax, which is progressive, but that is only taxed on the younger generation. Consumption tax is paid by all the, all the people who are living and, and consuming and proportional to the consumption. So rich retired uh, pensioners with a lot of assets also consume and pay taxes. I think that's much fairer given the population's declining uh, than the uh, personal income tax, which is only paid by workers. Um, so th that's one. Two, that if, you, if I go back uh, on a, a time machine, that uh, what I would propose 
uh, is that uh, 2014 consumption tax uh, rate hike um, would have been should have been delayed probably by one year. Um, I was you know in the in the panel of ec economists who recommended that tax rate hike should go uh, uh, as scheduled. It was decided much earlier. Uh, but um, you know, just think, thinking, looking back from this year, uh, that uh, maybe that was premature. But that's that's the only regret um, I have. The another one is the uh, historical regret. Another one is that I would much prefer to have much smaller step in increase. So it's like one percent. Uh, one percentage point increase uh, every year, uh, rather than three percent jump in uh, uh, at at the time. So that's that's more technical way of how to raise consumption tax. But um, uh, that has to be done in time to uh, to prevent that future generations will be uh, uh, will be taxed unfairly. Uh, in, in the medium term or long term. Takeo? So for, for the questions on if the, uh, whether the Japan should have increased more the taxes or, or, or not, um, I, I think I would look at the other side of the budget deficit, which is expenditures. And uh, what happened in Japan is that they needed to raise the taxes in order to finance the expenditures that, that increased over time or sometime temporarily through a fiscal stimulus. And I think uh, what we know is those uh, fiscal stimulus by uh, increasing the expenditures and creating budget deficit did not quite work in Japan after the uh, 1990s. Um, the, when Japan was, uh, Japanese economy was growing in mid 2000, the budget deficit actually declined. So the budget deficit seems to be more of a result of the economic conditions than the other way around. So uh, if I can go back, uh, I would have argued to limit the raise of the government expenditures more than increasing taxes. And that applies to a social security system uh, as well. The, we, we are giving out, um, the, at least for some population, they're giving out the generous uh, the pension, pension funds. And uh, the, those uh, may be uh, reconsidered. And I want to add uh, one more thing about the consumption tax versus the personal income tax. I think we are often too occupied by the idea that the consumption tax is a good thing to increase rather than the personal income tax. I think there is a good part, good aspect of the personal income tax as well. That, that is, you can design the tax system more progressively, uh, which uh, leads to a different kind of fairness uh, in the population. And also, uh, as some people started to argue, uh, tax on assets maybe a good idea from some uh, equity point of view. And the one last thing, there's the one tax that uh, Japan doesn't use very much now, which is uh, the environmental tax or the tax on uh, greenhouse gas, for example. And by introducing the, those environmental tax, uh, that should, I, I haven't done the calculation, so how much in terms of the magnitude that helps, but uh, that helps in the right direction. So, so I, I, I realize that um, I'm, I'm having a problem because there's, there's so many things I want to ask you and there, there have been a lot of uh, great questions in the uh, Q&A section, um, but I also want to make sure we cover a bunch of different topics. So I'm going to shift gears um, a little bit and, uh, and kind of move a little over into monetary policy. You have a wonderful chapter in your book, uh, chapter five, which uh, uh, talks about, about monetary policy. Um, I mean, one of the challenges uh, Japan seems to be having in the current COVID-19 crisis is that you know, with interest rates zero or negative, um, um, there doesn't seem to be much of a response uh, to the large decline in 
economic activities due to the, the pandemic. And we talked a little bit about some of the fiscal response uh, in terms of the, the, the payments to uh, uh, households. Um, are there any, you know, so, so I guess one question is, uh, is the Bank of Japan out of ammunition at this point? Um, are there any insights uh, from your chapter five uh, monetary policy that can help us understand uh, what the future is gonna look like? Okay, let me start. Um, so it is true that in this uh, COVID-19 crisis this year, that there have not been, uh, you know, major steps. There are several steps that Bank of Japan did, but no major steps like deepening the uh, deepening the negative interest rate or the um, you know doubling, tripling of the uh, government bond purchases. Uh, so they didn't do them, uh, but they, they did smaller things. I think a major kick is that uh, automatic uh, uh, purchase of the government bonds uh, by the um, yield curve control. So yield curve control is to uh, fix the policy rate at minus 0.1% and a 10 year bond rate at, um, uh, at 0, 0.0 plus minus uh, some band. So uh, to keep the long bond rate around zero means that the Bank of Japan will buy uh, government bonds automatically. So government has increased the issuance of the government bonds uh, to the um, uh, to the um, uh, ninety trillion yen uh, this year, uh, which means that um, uh, uh, you know it's it's not doubling, but the uh, it's like fifty percent increase of the government bond um, uh, issuance, which has been absorbed by the central bank uh, purchases. And so it, it's in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a cooperation between monetary policy and the fiscal policy, which is the uh, uh, combating, uh, uh, which combat, combats this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So um, monetary policy is not really forefront of uh, battling the COVID-19, but now it's cooperative efforts between central bank and, uh, and the government because most of the expenditure to the income transfer and COVID-19 uh, 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 back vaccine uh, subsidies and, and so on, those are fiscal policy that it's not the monetary policy and fiscal policy is supporting those fiscal policy. Do you want to add something? I, I I'd, I'd like to add what, one more thing. And uh, I want to thank David for mentioning chapter five of our book. And the one thing you have noticed is uh, in the first edition, there was only one chap chapter for financial system and monetary policy. Now we have two chapters, chapter five and six. And as you, as you read in the textbook, uh, Bank of Japan has been a pioneer of unconventional monetary policy. And the one thing, uh, again, new that the Bank of Japan is doing or relatively new uh, the Bank of Japan is doing in this COVID-19, in addition to the everything Taka said, is uh, encouraging the private sector banks to extend the low interest rate loans, uh, zero interest rate loans by uh, adding the positive 0.1% interest to the, the bank's deposit at the Bank of Japan, the, what, what they call uh, current account balance. And um, uh, the Bank of Japan has been doing that uh, now. And, on, and also recently, uh, last month, the Bank of Japan announced a new facility called a Special Deposit Facility to enhance the resilience of the regional financial system. And this is again, the same type of policy, the pay, extra interest rate on their deposit at the Bank of Japan uh, for the regional financial institutions who want to, who are committed to contribute to the development of the regional economies and uh, do some um, cost cutting or extending more credit or merging with uh, some other uh, financial institutions to become more efficient. 
So uh, that's, I, I think, uh, yet uh, another new thing the Bank of Japan is doing. And we will see how those uh, become effective. So, so I, I, uh, that, yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that, um, you know, I kind of mentioned in my opening remarks is that, you know, Japan has been you know, dealing with deflation longer than anyone else and has become a real innovator in terms of how to think about it. You know, I think it was very difficult at the beginning to, to um, deal with this problem and they made a number of missteps, I think. But now I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's at the forefront of, of uh, monetary policy. Um, we just have a few minutes left and I, I wanna just talk, um, I, I, I see we've had a, a, a couple of questions that have popped up from Maria Solis at, at Brookings and, um, and Jun Saito uh, asking about inequality in, in Japan. And, um, um, and, and uh, this is a little related to um, you know, pop, population issues uh, more generally, which you deal with in, in, in chapter eight and on demography and things like this. Um, and I wondered, you know, um, how, you know, I, I, on the one, you know, one, one of the reasons potentially why you might want to do these, these transfer payments, um, you know, following COVID is that, is that certain households may be um, disproportionately hit uh, by this, you know, poorer households may be hit and you know, that might cause contractions in, in, in expenditures. But a different issue has been, you know, that, that I think we're seeing in much of the world is this rise in inequality. What are your thoughts about how, you know, uh, what is happening to inequality in Japan? Um, you know, how um, is it gonna get worse? Uh, you know, uh, Taka was mentioning, you know, trying to, was, was you know, very concerned clearly about intergenerational inequality and how the consumption tax kind of will, will effectively transfer money from the elderly to, to younger Japanese. But what about among Japanese um, poverty and inequality issues? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, let me start. Um, so um, uh, it, it, it is true, I think in Japan, but also uh, in US and, and other advanced um, uh, countries, that uh, th there's a divergence uh, called a skill premium. So the, in the tech or the digitalizations uh, come to the society that some, some people and some jobs are uh, fit to benefit uh, from those uh, digitalization and, um, uh, and a new way of doing businesses. So, um, those who are in that job category, um, they, they, uh, they see that wages to go up. But those who are not in those um, uh, uh, fields and um, uh, in the, let's say, stagnant uh, 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 job, stagnant field, then uh, 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 that, you know, they do not see wage increases. And this divergence is um, uh, happening uh, in Japan, but that's, that's similar to other economies. The problem is that um, uh, two, twofold, I, I, I think. One is that population is declining. So um, th that we have to steer uh, from those scarce resources, which workers, from the, uh, those stagnant field, which could be replaced by robots to the uh, booming fields. And two, that um, um, uh, most efficient way to do is to make the education <clears throat> uh, fit to have the new, 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 um, uh, new normal. And um, I worry that Japanese education is not changing quickly enough to, uh, to, to prepare students for the uh, new new normal. So that's a way to reduce the uh, reduce the inequality. Uh, let me add one thing that uh, which I we're, 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 we're basically out of time. So so okay. Um, All right. Talk but, but, oh, so ahead. just just, just, one, just one, 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 thing, one thing to add. The income inequality is a one thing we did not include in the second edition of this textbook, and we are starting doing a research for the third edition. Okay. <laughs>
Very good. Very good. Well, well, um, uh, you know, I, I, I first have to apologize to the, the audience. We, there, I, there were so many questions. I couldn't uh, get, get everybody's questions in there. And, um, uh, but uh, read the book. It's a wonderful book. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today and also especially thank Taka and Takeo uh, for wonderful um, presentation and uh, discussion. Um, it was great to hear, you know, every time I, I talk to you guys, I, I always learn so much. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, and just before ending, I also want to thank our uh, corporate um, uh, sponsors and individual sponsors um, who, who um, uh, provide us with, with uh, the financial means to put these events on. Uh, I, quite mean, I mean this uh, quite literally, without your support, we would simply couldn't do it. Uh, it means uh, a tremendous amount to us and to, to I think, uh, U.S.-Japan relations. Um, so with, without any further ado, I just want to thank again everybody for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you all at future CJEB events.